I'm Eric Anderson. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, protesters tell Mayor Bob Filner he is not welcome back to San Diego City Hall. Pico, one month into the mayor's scandal, we find out what, if any, impact it may have on San Diego's economy. Then UC San Diego researchers tell us why we don't all end up with Alzheimer's, how the new findings could change future treatment options. And we'll show you how the VA is turning to technology to help veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Thanks for joining us. Dwayne Brown is off tonight. This was the day for San Diego Mayor Bob Filner to respond to a recall notice filed against him. A response is not required, but if he gives one, the recall actually goes to a vote. A uh, statement would have been included on the ballot if it was on the ballot. Without a response, the ballot would state the mayor did not respond. Recall organizer Michael Palomari says the effort is on track and he is encouraged by the response. And you already hear that our elected officials are finally talking recall. They're saying the R word, not resignation. Now they're saying recall. Mr. Filner will not resign. I mean, that's a God-given certainty. It's not in his DNA. This man will not go away. We need to take him out of office. We need to remove him. Palomari can start circulating recall petitions to registered voters on Sunday. The mayor's response is not required for that vote to go forward. Now, uh, Palomari needs to collect just over 100,000 signatures in order to qualify the measure for the ballot. The mayor was a focal point of a rally just outside City Hall today, Filner being buffeted by accusations of sexual harassment and improper behavior. He returned from an intensive therapy program over the weekend. Today, protesters, television cameras, and curious onlookers gathered at the Bob Filner Not Welcome Back rally. Ben Katz said the mayor needs to hear that he is no longer welcome. Proud because of the people here today and the thousands, tens of thousands of other San Diegans who have stood up and said, this is not acceptable. We have said that Bob Filner does not represent us. And Bob Filner must go. Bob Filner has betrayed the contract he has with San Diegans. He has betrayed the values he said he supported in elected office for over three decades. He has preyed upon women ceaselessly and we will not stand idly by while sexual harassment is perpetrated by the very leader we elected to combat that behavior. The rally was put together by a coalition including Democrats, Independents, and Republicans. The city's audit committee will take a closer look at the mayor's use of city credit cards during his recent trip to Paris. It's been controversial because of questions about who paid for it and its benefit to San Diego. Filner says a nonprofit Iranian group invited him, which paid part of the expenses. But our media partner 10 News learned the group was a not a nonprofit, and the city taxpayers paid $22,000 for Filner's security detail. The mayor has reimbursed the Iranian group in keeping with state law. He also says the trip was intended to improve the city's international business relationships. After a month of uncertainty surrounding the future of Mayor Bob Filner, Peggy Pico finds out the impact of the scandal on San Diego's economy. Biocom, a local association representing 500 life science companies, joined other influential business leaders today in calling for the mayor's resignation. Here to talk about what, if any, impact the mayor's scandal may have on San Diego's economy is Eric Bruvold, president of National University System Institute for Policy Research. Welcome back. Welcome. Good to be here. And Eric, aside from the legal fees associated with this scandal, what kind of economic price might San Diego pay uh, for the scandal? Sure. The biggest concern right now is just the uncertainty. Are we going to have the same mayor tomorrow as we have today, in a week, in a month, in, a, in six months? Um, and that kind of uncertainty really cuts back and forestalls business investment that might flow into our region, principally around those areas that the mayor has control over, such as land development or the tourism uh, industry. How 
about is in regards to like federal or state partnerships? Does that have any influence? Um, to a certain extent. I mean, clearly the Chamber of Commerce is going back to Washington, D.C. I think in the next couple of weeks. They disinvited the mayor from that trip. It doesn't provide a really strong unified front of local leadership, and that can only hurt in a time of federal budget uncertainty. And what about the idea that, you know, um, so Biocom, and as you mentioned, you know, the Chamber of Commerce disinvited, uh, you know, the mayor. Is this political discord really have an impact on market-based economy? Um, you know, to a certain extent, we invested a lot of power under the strong mayor when we made that charter reform. He really has the ability to either move a development project forward or to put the brakes on. And it isn't so much the person that's in office right now. Bob, uh, Bob filner has got certain policy preferences as opposed to others. It's really basically this uncertainty and this unknown quality. I mean, we've had rumors, it seems like, every week whether the mayor is going to be here or gone or whatever. And I think that those kinds of things lead prudent business people to say, mm, time out, we'll wait and see till things become more settled in the San Diego marketplace. Let's go back to that strong uh, mayor form of government here. When it comes to like city permits, processes, contract signatures, does that all fall on the mayor's desk or can the city move forward without without him? I uh, know, not really. And so that's one of the big changes that we made. As if viewers might remember, we had the era of uh, uh, Mayor Dick Murphy and the worst city mayor in America. He resigned. We had sort of an interim period of time. But that was the period under the city manager form of government. So many of the routine permitting processes could move forward. We've seen over the past six months that Mayor Filner um, both wants to and is willing to move into the fairly routine um, and day-to-day -day permitting processes. Um, his uh, paralysis that's going on right now in that office has thrown many of those things into question and just created tremendous uncertainty. Has it? Is there a backlog, do you think? Absolutely. There's a backlog, and then there's people just don't know what's going to happen. Will the mayor show up at a planning group meeting to oppose my project? Will the mayor stop a routine permit from moving forward? Um, I think that if Mayor Filner wasn't undergoing the political crisis, people could say, well, this is what we expect, and this is how we plan, they plan for, it. for it. a little bit But But now better. they just have no clue. Now, Gary London, he's um, a, a real estate e economist. He says that the mayor's influence on the economy is limited. Tourists are still going to come to the zoo. They're still going to go to Legoland. He sees city business as running, you know, pretty much as usual. Why do you disagree? Well, I think that there is that. There's sort of the underlying economy. But then there's the stuff on top of it where the mayor and city leadership really does have control. Attracting business investment, and particularly when it refers to big development projects. Putting together public-private partnerships like we have to do for the convention center. The uncertainty around the tourist marketing or the film, uh, the film bureau. Right, the film Freedom Bureau, yeah, which absolutely. was his baby, right? And these things, well, the baby mm -hmm. which he killed, I mean, mm -hmm. threw out with the bathwater uh, when he uh, pushed back on mm -hmm. the tourist marketing district. So those things are really sort of on top of what would be the normal economic conditions. I would agree with Gary. The mayor has limited influence under that baseline, but the incremental stuff on top, leadership really does matter. Okay, if there is an actual uh, overall kind of economic impact because of this scandal, where do you think we would see it first? And how could we be sure that's being linked to the scandal and it's just not other influences? Sure. Um, I think where you're going to see it is, is you're going to see it in the 50, 60,000 jobs that we have in the region's construction industry. Um, California is showing a rebound in that area. We're seeing some more investment flow in and the real estate market's uh, back under recovery mode. If, ca if San Diego flatlines, doesn't see any additive growth, and yet we see it in the rest of California, I think we can attribute that lack of growth to this crisis here in San Diego. Okay. Now National University's uh, Eric Bruvald. Thank you so much. Good to be here. You can find more of our coverage of this ongoing story online at kpbs.org slash news slash Filner. Sixteen-year-old Hannah Anderson is home safe tonight, a week after being kidnapped. Her suspected kidnapper was shot and killed by the FBI on Saturday. James DiMaggio is also suspected of killing Hannah's mother and younger brother. Investigators say Hannah didn't know about their deaths until she was rescued. As for my daughter, the healing process will be slow. She has been through a tremendous, horrific ordeal. I'm very proud of her and I love her very much. She is surrounded by the love of her family, friends, and community. 
San Diego County Sheriff Bill Gore is not saying much about what they've learned from Hannah so far. He does say that she was under great duress throughout the kidnapping ordeal, and she told them that DiMaggio fired a shot at agents before he was shot himself. Gore says the investigation continues. We might never know some of these answers. I think that's important to realize now. When you get a completely uh, irrational act like we've seen here with the two murders and the kidnapping, uh, sometimes you're not going to be able to come up with a rational explanation of what happened. This case, incidentally, is the first one in which a statewide AMBER alert was issued by cell phone. Gore says there are still some bugs to be worked out in the system. One of the things I've, I'm aware of from my own alert that I got on my iPhone is that the alert pops up and then after you've read it, it's gone so you can't just go back in like you would a text message and look at it again to determine what that license number was if you'd see the car. And I think those are some of the things they're working on. Hannah Anderson's father says the Amber Alert led police to his daughter, and he's asking people to pay careful attention when alerts like that are issued in the future. Today, a judge ordered three years probation for a far middle school teacher arrested for bringing a loaded gun to campus. Ned Walker pleaded guilty to a felony charge of possessing a firearm in a school zone. He's also been sentenced to community service and a gun safety class. Walker's lawyer says he brought the gun to school to protect students. And he says the felony conviction means he'll most likely lose his job as a teacher. California became the first state to grant certain rights to transgender students in public schools. A bill signed today by Governor Jerry Brown will allow transgendered K-12 students to use whichever restroom and locker room they want and to play on girls' or boys' sports teams. Supporters say it will help reduce bullying and discrimination against transgender students, but opponents say it could lead to invasions of privacy for other students. Southern California Edison is trying to brace its customers for millions of dollars in shutdown costs for the San Onofre nuclear plant. In a full-page L.A. Times ad, Edison says it's working to get money from its insurance companies and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. That's the company that made the plant's troubled steam generators. Edison warns that there may be costs that are not recovered from Mitsubishi and the insurers, and those costs could be significant. The ad also explains how utilities recover their costs for equipment over time and says if a utility asset must be retired before the end of its expected life, the utility recovers from its customers its reasonable investment costs. The nuclear plant has been offline since January 2012. Nearly a quarter of veterans return home with post-traumatic stress disorder, but only a few actually seek treatment. Hectic schedules, transportation challenges, and the persistent stigma regarding mental health may prevent those in need from seeking help. But KPBS reporter Taryn Mento tells us about a program that's helping the VA break down some of those barriers. After an hour-long commute from Yuma, Ruben Moreno-Garcia arrives at his El Centro apartment and immediately boots up his laptop. First thing, he checks his email. And I received two emails. One is a reminder for his weekly counseling session. The Army vet was diagnosed with PTSD after serving three tours in combat. The other has a username and password to connect to his weekly counseling session. And with a couple of rings, he's face to face. All right, I've got no, oh, there we go, video. Or face to screen, rather, with Dr. Katherine Williams. She's his psychologist located 100 miles away at the San Diego VA. It's called telemental health, virtually connecting patient with psychologist. And the San Diego VA is the West Coast leader on launching the program. For almost a decade, we've been providing some type of telehealth care. That's Dr. Neelis Shaw, who runs the telehealth program. It got its start as a way to monitor chronic disease among patients who lived far away. So, for example, we would have a diabetic patient who would submit daily their, their blood sugars or their blood pressure. The information would go to a secure website monitored by a nurse. Over the years, the program expanded to new areas, like psychiatry. But the question is, does it really work? At first, even Ruben said it was weird. There was some sense of kind of being distant. You couldn't really feel like trusting the brain because there was no, 
No physical, no physical interaction. Psychologist Stephen Thorpe agrees. He ran the PTSD clinic at the San Diego VA. And you do miss out on some things that you would get face to face. So you can't uh, touch the client. Like sometimes we shake a, a veteran's hand uh, and you can tell if they seem anxious, if their palm is warm or cool, things like that. But despite the lack of physical contact, Thorpe says the video conferencing is just as effective as face to face counseling. In fact, he was part of a team that just finished one of the largest studies on the matter. They compared more than 200 veterans. About half did face-to-face -face and the other did video conferencing. And so right after the 12 sessions were done, after 12 weeks, uh, the people who did face-to-face -face did a little bit better. But six months later, something interesting happened. And then we uh, asked them again six months later how they were doing in terms of their PTSD symptoms and found that the folks who went through video conferencing psychotherapy kept improving over the course of those six months until they were at the same level of the face-to-face -face folks. That was the case for Ruben, the combat veteran living in El Centro. Just more than a year ago, he was in a bad place. Uh, I was trying to do a, a swan dive from the roof onto concrete. He didn't jump. His dog actually prevented him from jumping until his mother came home. But he said he wanted to, and it wasn't the last time he tried something like that. After serving overseas as an army mechanic, he brought home a lot of memories he wished he never had. On his last tour, he was a wrecker. He'd retrieve parts from damaged vehicles and sometimes rescue troops that were still stuck inside them. If you were lucky, it will blow up far enough that only will be vehicle damage. Sometimes we weren't that lucky. Sometimes the vehicle actually gets blown upside down and, or sideways. And then, well, since these vehicles are made to keep people out, there's locks inside. When he got back to the U.S., he started the telehealth program twice a week from the satellite clinic in El Centro. But working in Yuma, it made it difficult to get to the clinic before closing time. Then a federal grant came through to fund the in-home conferencing he uses now. He's actually the first person in San Diego to try it, the first of only about 50. For Ruben, that's not enough. And that's why I don't mind doing this. So the word gets out and actually some speed, some dust gets picked up. Ruben said he hopes funding continues for the tech workers, server space, and psychologists that make the program possible. So eventually, all of his fellow vets get the chance to recover in the privacy of their own home. Because it worked for him. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. Some new research says, meanwhile, that there may be a link between autism and induced labor. The government-funded study says that drugs used to induce or speed up labor may increase the risk of autism. But the researchers say that more study is needed because labor is often induced due to complications such as diabetes in the mother and problems with the unborn baby. Both of those have also been linked to autism. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. Peggy Pico talks with local experts about the latest research from UC San Diego. Five million Americans have Alzheimer's, and with the nation's aging population, that number is expected to triple by 2050. But why does the disease afflict some and not others? Here to help answer that question are Subojet Roy, Associate Professor of Pathology and Neuroscience at UC San Diego, and Dr. Maria Carrillo, VP of Medical and Science Relations for the National Alzheimer's Association. Welcome. Thank you. And Dr. Roy, your research has found uh, that uh, we all have the same building blocks, uh, basically, that sort of can create Alzheimer's. So how come we don't all get it? So what we found is that um, even though we have the building blocks for creating the disease, what happens is that these two building blocks are actually shipped, if you will, in two different containers inside the cell. So the building blocks don't really come together which they have to do to initiate the, um, the pathology and the disease. So it's a protein and an enzyme, I understand, from what I, from what I could gather. Um, so they're in separate containers, but in Alzheimer's they come together. How would you, discovering this, how, how would that change how Alzheimer's is treated? Well, it's, um, it's a little early at this point, but I think it leads to a, sort of a new therapeutic avenue to explore at least where if we can kind of keep these two containers separate and prevent them from coming together to create the amyloid pathology, um, that's an exciting avenue. Right, so now you know there's two separate things that have to co-mingle and if you can keep them apart that might be of beneficial 
treatment. Right. Exactly. Okay. Okay, and Dr. Carrillo, there's no cure for Alzheimer's as we know, but could you tell us about some of the latest treatments? Absolutely. I mean, certainly there are some symptomatic uh, agents that are available today to relieve people uh, and who are having memory problems that are approved by the FDA. Unfortunately, none of those will slow down the progression of the disease or even stop it altogether. So Dr. Roy's work and the work of others uh, has shown us that there are a variety of therapeutic approaches out there, not only dealing with the proteins in the building blocks, but dealing with inflammation, potentially with the role diabetes can play in Alzheimer's disease, um, the role that strokes and potentially uh, epileptic seizures can actually play a role in marking the disease. So there's a lot of uh, therapeutic approaches being investigated and we at the Alzheimer's Association certainly fund quite a bit of them because no stone can be left unturned. Yeah, and, and you mentioned, uh, mentioned the diabetes. I understand there was a study kind of linking glucose and high glucose and Alzheimer's. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, certainly there's um, no such thing as diabetes in the brain, but you know, diabetes actually has huge implications on the entire body, including the brain. Uh, certainly even from the changes in your vasculature, your, your arteries and your veins that comes with diabetes, but also the insulin resistance that can happen in the brain. So uh, um, trying to find ways to combat that. And we also know that diabetes is a, a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So how all, does all that work together? That's under deep investigation today. More research for you, Dr. Roy. Now, I know for years there's been a lot of chatter about preventing dementia by doing crossword puzzles, keeping your brain active. Is there any research that supports that? Oh, absolutely. Um, there is. Uh I would say really good evidence that uh, if you um, engage in mental activities, then you not only reduce the deposition of amyloid beta in your brains, but you also delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease, both in uh, animal models, it's been shown very clearly, and a lot of epidemiologic studies uh, have confirmed that. What, um, what are, so you, you've come up with this idea and you're going to progress on the research with this. Um, what are some of the, the barriers that you encounter as far as trying to progress on trying to treat Alzheimer's? Is it anatomical with the blood-brain barrier? Is it uh, corporations and drugs? Is it all of the above? So it is all of the above, but unlike uh, if you think about cancer and compared to Alzheimer's, you know, we have so many sort of therapeutic approaches for cancer, but none for Alzheimer's. So in addition to all the problems that we have, the biological problems for cancer, in Alzheimer's disease and, and for that matter other diseases of the brain, we have the problem that we have to get that drug inside the brain. And that's also a tremendous challenge. So yeah, basically the, all of the above. In a, Dr. Korea, what are some of the challenges with developing drugs for Alzheimer's? Is it a uh, cost? What's going on there? I think certainly resources. Money is one of the biggest challenges that uh, we all face in, in the community. Um, certainly at the National Institutes of Health level, there have been a lot of challenges in funding at the federal level. The Alzheimer's Association, not only the uh, public policy office in Washington, D.C., but really the state office that, that the uh, San Diego and Imperial chapter work on our local office here, uh, we really push for funding for researchers like Dr. Roy because we think that that's a critical part of trying to make sure we understand the disease process before we try to treat it. Right, maybe a whole new way. Uh, we'll find out. So, uh, Dr. Roy and Dr. Carrillo, thank you so much, and uh, good Thanks luck with your research. Me. Thank you. Thank you. Every week we answer your questions about the Affordable Care Act in our special series, Second Opinion. Joining me to tackle a question on end-of-life care is Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks. Megan, who's asking our question this week? Sally Johnson lives in Mira Mesa. Her friend was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 1990, and she's been taking care of him ever since. During her 23 years as a caregiver, she's thought a lot about how the nation deals with end-of-life care. She's also British and says Americans just don't talk about death, and that puts a lot of stress on families and on our health system. Here's her question. I'm interested to know how the Affordable Care Act uh, handles end-of-life situations and expensive chronic illnesses like dialysis and heart transplants for people over 50. So does Obamacare give us new guidelines and limitations on care? So you may recall those so-called death panels that were so controversial. There was a lot of talk early on about how to address health care costs for the elderly and the dying in the Affordable Care Act. The president had wanted these end-of-life counseling sessions to be a billable service. The idea was that to provide a clear route to make decisions about when to forego treatment would level family expectations and reduce costly life-sustaining procedures. But it was ultimately scrapped because it was just so controversial. And what we're left with is a much milder version. The law basically says that p patients can voluntarily talk about it with their doctor during annual wellness visits. 
And is the law doing anything to help caregivers like Johnson? Yes and no. It established an insurance policy that working adults can buy to cover future in-home support services, and that could include paying a loved one as a caregiver. It also provides some additional Medi-Cal funding to help keep people at home. But the law also mandates that Medicare reduce its reimbursement rate for home caregivers, and the state also recently made some similar cuts. So people like Johnson really aren't seeing much change. Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks to ask your Affordable Care Act question. Go to kpbs.org slash second opinion. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, police tracking our movements by recording license plates. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. Temperature is going to start going up over the next couple of days. Expect the range in the mid-70s along the coastal areas. It's going to start to head up into the upper 70s by Thursday. Inland temperatures will be in the 80-degree range, about the same in the mountains with a little bit more sunshine. And, of course, out in the desert areas, look for triple-digit temperatures with lots of sun there, 111 by Thursday. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app. It's all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks very much for joining us. Have a great evening.